Amen. So, last chapter of the book of Matthew. Uh, it's been a great book to go through. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, don't feel that I did it justice. I don't know that anybody ever preaches any book of the Bible and says, yeah, I nailed it. I got every point. <laughs> you know, or it doesn't go back and read it and say, why didn't I think about it? Or hear somebody else preach right. and say, I missed that point or whatever. But it uh, just goes to show how deep the book is. And, yeah. <clears throat> you know, first time I've ever preached through a book, so... Hopefully, uh, you know, it only gets better from here. <laughs> so, but in Matthew chapter 28, the Bible reads in verse 1, in the, in, uh, in, the end of, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. So what we have here in the beginning, of course, there's several different accounts of how this all took place. And a lot of people, you know, not just in this particular portion of Scripture in the Gospels, but... A lot of times people are always trying to synchronize the, the, the Gospels and figure out how everything went and exactly the chronology and, and what happened. And sometimes it kind of leads to some confusion. And you got to kind of just, I think, take it a little bit of time. And the more we read these things, they come more and more clear exactly how everything happened and who was there and who was involved, was involved and wasn't. And really, in this in the resurrection of Christ, when they're coming to the cave, you know, there's so many things that... that you have to kind of really sit down and look at for a while and, and, and try to pick apart to figure out exactly how everything took place. But uh, I think, you know, there's just some surface truths that we can get out of this, you know, without having to try and dive too deep. Because what I found is when you try to make all that stuff fit, you know, it, it's a lot of times you really you have to question, did I really get it right, you know? And, and uh, so I really didn't want to go into that, like when the stone was rolled away, you know, because it says they... They came and saw the stone rolled away. Here it sounds like the stone was rolled away at that moment. And I'm sure there's a perfectly good explanation. You know, I just don't, I just don't have it. So <laughs> we'll just take the scripture. You know, it's, it's there uh, to give us a lot of other truths too. And one of them is that, uh, you know, we can learn a little bit about these Marys here. You know, in the Bible, Mary is, is, a, is a name that comes up a lot in the New Testament. And it's important to kind of pay attention to which Mary is being spoken of because, uh, you know, it could change, you know, uh, uh, what the, the meaning of the, the scripture that's being used or, or the application that can be made. So, of course, here it says in Matthew 28 that uh, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Now, that's not the only women that were there. There were other women there. There were more than just these two Marys that were present. So keep something in Matthew 28 as always, but... Turn over to Luke 24. Turn over to Luke 24. There were several other women, and I think there was even more women that were that were named uh, in, the, in the Gospels that were present at this moment. But it says in uh, Luke 24, you're going there, but it says in Luke 23, I'll read to you, it says, <clears throat> this is of course right after crucifixion when they're, they're getting ready to bury the body of Christ. Um, and it says, And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the, the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So it says, the women also. So this is a group of women. And it says there in Luke 24, verse 1, where you are. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to the rest. Verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and other women uh, that were with them, which told them these things of the apostles. So when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we see right away that there was more than just Mary and, um, and Magdalene and the other Mary. There were several different women there. And uh, go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. So who, who were these ladies? You, know, you have Mary Magdalene, you have Joanna, you have Mary, the mother of James, and uh, Salome was, the, was another one that was mentioned there, where we just read now, uh, in Matthew 16, verse 1, excuse me, that's where we find Salome, it says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome uh, had brought sweet uh, spices that they might come in, uh, and anoint him. So there was, there's four ladies mentioned right there. So we know that at least of these four ladies that were there, we know them by name. Now, who are they? Now, first of all, of course, we have Mag, uh, Mary Magdalene. That should be probably a name that we're familiar with a little bit more. Uh, she was a woman that the scripture tells us Jesus had cast out uh, seven devils out of her. He healed her of those evil spirits. You're there in Luke 8. But it says in Luke 16, Now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So we know that's who she is. She's this woman that Jesus had healed. And it says there in Luke 8, verse 2, where you, you are, 
And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So what's interesting is that Mary Magdalene wasn't the only woman there that had had devils cast out of her. It says there, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. So that's plural. There were several women there that Jesus had performed this particular miracle on. Right. And, uh, you know, it just goes to show that they were so grateful for what he did. They, I mean, they followed him. They wanted, they were, uh, you know, committed to him and just and, and hearing what he had to say. And even when he was, you know, crucified and buried, they were obviously very moved by that and Man. followed him. So they were very grateful for the things that Jesus had done unto them. And it says here, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom was seven devils, verse 3. She was one of those, you know. And then I believe it lists these other ladies in verse 3. These ladies did not have devils cast out of them. I think it's just listing more names. But Mary Magdalene is the only lady that's given by name, out of whom seven devils were cast. And it says, and Joanna, the wife of Cuzza, Herod's steward. Now that's an interesting person right there. Here you have a, a lady who's the wife of Cuzza, Herod's steward. Right, she's she's the wife of the man that you know, to whatever. I don't know exactly what his role was to Herod. You know, I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's it's referring to King Herod here, but he was one that was very close to Herod. You know, so uh, and it goes on and says, and Susanna and many others was ministered unto them of their substance. So we have Joanna. She's the next one that that's listed. And who is she? She's the wife of this of this man Cuzza, which goes to show us that Joanna was a woman of prominence. You know, she was a woman of high standing in society. You know, she she uh, she probably. I mean, this is kind of just conjecture, but if you recall, I believe it's in John where where Herod desires to to to, to hear from Jesus, to, that he might see some miracle from him, for he had heard many many things of him. Kind of paraphrasing there. Mm -hmm. But who do you think he heard all those things from? Right. You know, I wonder. Huh. I mean, this is just conjecture again. Yeah. I, this is my opinion. I'm just throwing this out there. That maybe you know Joanna was telling Cuzza, and Cuzza was telling Herod, you know, we kind of got the grapevine there a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing is, we have this woman, obviously, who has of a high standing in society, you know, that she she was still humble enough in her heart to, to understand who Jesus was and to follow him. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have Salome. She was the other one that was mentioned there. And she was one that was present at the crucifixion, which you read in, in Mark 15, mm -hmm. where it says, among whom was Mary Magdalene, the married mother of James the Less, and of Joseph, and Salome. So there's... Four women uh, by name. Now, of course, the last one we haven't looked at was Mary, the mother of James. So who is Mary, the mother of James? Well, Mary, the mother of James, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is the Virgin Mary, of course. Of course, at this point, you know, sorry, you know, uh, Catholics, she's not still a virgin. She's had several other children at this point. That's why it says right there, the mother of James and other passages, you know, it tells us she had several other children. So if you would, go over to uh, Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And he went out from hence and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when, he was the Sabbath, uh, when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence uh, hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Jodas, and uh, Joseph, and of Judah, and Simon, and are, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So there, right there, we can see that, you know, Mary had, you know, besides Jesus, she had given birth to James, Joseph, and Judah, and Simon, and at least two other sisters. So Mary, at a minimum, had, you know, if you include uh, the Lord in that, had a minimum of seven children that she had given birth to. So it's just a, a, a foolish doctrine uh, to sit there and say that she was this perpetual virgin throughout right. her life. And, uh, of course, it's interesting there in Matthew how the Bible refers to Mary. You know, and this is something I kind of want to focus in on a little bit because it's an important doctrine. Um, and it teaches us something that we should not think above men, uh, you know, uh, we should not think more highly of men than we ought to. You know, that there, you know, of course, there's a certain respect that we should show people. Some people, you know, the Bible says that we should, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, that, that, that those that rule well are counted worthy of double honor. You know, that there's a certain amount of respect that is to be paid to some people. And, of course, we're supposed to respect everybody, and you know, we're supposed to love the brotherhood and all that. But sometimes people with certain in certain instances, they get carried away. And the, the Catholics, they get they get way out of hand with Mary. I mean, they take it to a whole other level. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about it. But it's interesting there, if you look there in Matthew 28, verse 1, I know we haven't gotten any further than verse 1 so far. But it says there, as the begin, uh, began... Uh, at the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. 
You know, it doesn't even call her, doesn't call her Mary, the mother of our Lord. Right. It doesn't call her Mary, the queen of heaven. Right. It doesn't call her Mary, you know, it doesn't even call her the Mary mother of anybody. It just says, and that other Mary. Right. You know, it's, it's very, it's not, I'm not saying it's being uh, disrespectful, but what it isn't doing, the narrator of the scripture isn't trying to overemphasize who Mary is. Right. As the Catholics love to do. And, and they, they do do that. So it refers to as the other Mary. And just showing us that the Bible doesn't venerate Mary or endorse the worship of her at the very, you know, especially that. Nowhere do you find in Scripture the Bible instructing us to pray to Mary or to pray to the saints or to pray to an idol or to right. bow down. In fact, the Bible condemns it. If you would, right. turn over to 2 Kings chapter 5. Keep something in, in Matthew, of course, but go back to 2 Kings chapter 5. Because uh, make no doubt about it, you know, and this is a criticism that. Catholics are now trying to, they, you know, I, I, I brought this up to Catholics in the past, and they'll say, well, you know, I said, you guys worship Mary. And now they've got these ways where they're, because they, it's, it's so obvious in the Bible that we're not to, to worship Mary. You know, we're not to worship anyone but our Lord. And, you know, they, they, you know for there's one mediator uh, uh, between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Right. You know, there's one mediator. There is no mediatrix. Right. You know, we're not to be praying to these other saints or, to, or praying to Mary. And they'll say, and then now they have all these ways to say, well, we don't, we don't worship Mary. We just venerate her. Right. We just show a high degree of respect for Mary. And they have all these reasons. And I really don't want to spend the whole sermon on it because this is actually a topic, you know, the, the Catholic Church is and something I'm considered about preaching on, so I don't want to, you know, uh, just, yeah. just, just blow the whole wad here tonight. But <laughs> the thing is, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 5, look at verse 17 where it says, and Naaman said, uh, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules, bird and bird? Now, of course, this is a story of Naaman. Let me give you a little background. So Naaman is, is, is this, uh, you know, the, I believe it's a Syrian who comes. He has a leprosy. And he comes to Elijah the prophet. And he says, you know, go dip thyself in the river Jordan seven times. You know, at first he's upset. And he's not going to do it. And he goes and does it. And, and he comes out. And the Bible says that his, his skin was like that of a newborn, like of a baby, you know. I don't know what all that entails, but you know that he had very he was healed of his disease. That was right. the point. And here in 17, he's being he's very grateful. You know, now he believes. He's a believer. And I believe Naaman got saved. You know, I believe Naaman's a saved man in scripture. And he says, For thy servant will henceforth not, uh, offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. So he became a believer in the Lord. Now look at verse 18. And this thing of the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth in the house of Rimmon to worship there. And leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant. And this thing. You see, why did I bring this up? Because when you bring up uh, Mary worship to a Catholic, what they'll say is, well, we don't worship her. They say, oh, really? Well, let's go on Google and put Pope bowing Mary. And what, look at all the images of the Pope, you know, doing this and doing this, and kissing the feet and getting down and, right. and praying to Mary, you know, and looking up and praying and folding the hands. They're bowing, right? right? That's one of the things they're doing. Now, that's you can say that's reverence all you want, or you can say that they're just vener he's just venerating her. But look at the description we have here of what takes place here. It says that when I, he goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, right? He's going there to worship in the house of Rimmon. And what takes place in the worship? He's bowing himself, right? So bowing is a form of worship. When you're bowing to somebody, you're worshiping them. I mean, when they came to Peter and they, and they threw themselves at his feet, he said, stand up for I'm a man. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and several times in Scripture we see people, they, when they would worship somebody, they would fall on their face, they would bow. So, you know, make, they, they can try to weasel their way out of it all they want. They pray to Mary, they bow to Mary, they worship Mary. That's right. You know, and there was a time when they were not ashamed to admit that. Mm -hmm. But now it's like they're being called out on it more often, and, and, they, and they don't like the idea of it for some reason. You know, except for the Catholic Catholics, you know, that you, sometimes you run into the old school Catholics, they, they will say, yeah, we worship her. You know, and they, and they don't mind. But, uh, so they're trying to kind of, for whatever reason, they feel like now they've got to backtrack and get out of it. But make no mistake about it, they do worship her. And, uh, you know, they'll say, they'll say, no, we just venerate her. You know, and why not? Why shouldn't we venerate Mary? You know, and they'll have all these different objections. And, I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to spend all night on it, but it does say, they'll say, well, you know, God sent the Savior through Mary. You know, that's how, that's how Jesus Christ came to earth. You know, out of all the ways that Jesus could have come to earth, why was Mary chosen? You know, why, why did he choose Mary? You know, he could have chosen anybody. Well, you know, he did have to choose somebody that had that lineage. 
you know, you see in Luke. So that does narrow it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Could have just chose anybody. Right. Right. They'll say, but yeah, but he chose Mary, you know. And that obviously means that Mary was very important to God. So if Mary is so important to God, should she mean something to us? Should she be important to us too? Well, I mean, yeah, she's important in the sense that she was the mother, you know, she gave physical birth to our Lord. But, you know, if God, let's, let's just follow me. If God could have chosen anybody, then does that really make her important then? I mean, does it matter at that point who he chose? Right. And if he could chose anybody, does it matter that he chose Mary? I mean, he had to choose somebody, right? You know, and and so <laughs> it doesn't, uh, just because uh, she was chosen of God, that doesn't make her so important that we have to, you know, make statues of her. You know, we don't have to, like, put her on a pedestal, literally, and put her on her shoulders and walk her, an image of her, supposedly, mm -hmm. that's what she looks like, through a town. Yep, right. And just stop everything for that day, mm -hmm. you know, and, and throw garlands on it, and, and whatever else takes place, you know, in, in these worships of Mary, in these, uh, these, these worship services of Mary. Uh, you know, why does God choose Mary? Well, the Bible doesn't explicitly say why. The Bible doesn't say, this is why the Lord chose Mary. Uh, well, maybe we could kind of just think of some reasons why God chose. Well, maybe because of her obedience. If you would turn over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, the Bible says, you're going to verse 48, but it says in verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, and the angel departed from her. So you remember in Luke where the angel comes to her and tells her that she's going to give, you know, that holy thing which shall be born of thee, you know, uh, you know, that she was going to give birth to the Savior, and she doesn't object. Mm -hmm. Now, when other people were, were told about the birth of Christ, like when they came to uh, uh, forget name, uh, Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, the high priest, and he, they tells him that, you know, you're going to give birth, she's going to give birth to John the Baptist. He says, you know, how, you know, how am I going to know? Yeah. And what happened to him? You know, he's, he's yeah. made deaf until the birth of the child. Mm -hmm. Or not deaf. He was mute. Yeah, thank you. So he... You know, he has a punishment because he doubted, right? Yeah. And, you know, we see that in other places, too, similar things. But Mary, she doesn't have that kind of attitude. What does she say? She just says, just says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Maybe that's why God chose her, because he knew that she was just a humble, obedient person that would just believe God. Right. You know, not that she was something special in and of herself, but that she was just a good example of somebody who, who was humble and obedient. You know, and, that, and you know, her humility has probably had a lot to do with it. Look at Luke uh, uh, 1, uh, 48. And she says, For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. The lowest state of his handmaid. She knew that she was of a low estate. So maybe one of the reasons why God chose Mary is because she was so humble and knew that she wouldn't go out of her way to make a big deal about herself right. and remind everybody, well, you know, <laughs> I had to give birth to him. You know, mm -hmm. you like those miracles? Enjoying that bread? <laughs> Good fish, right? right? Well, you know, that's my boy. You know? And just taking, try to have some kind of credit. And isn't that exactly what's taking place in the Catholic Church? You know, if Mary were actually here to see all of that, she'd probably be embarrassed. Yeah. She'd probably say, take all that down. Yeah. What are you doing? Right. You know, and, and she would say, you know, whatever he says, do it. You know, and she would point, as she always did, point people to the Lord. Right. And not to herself. So that's probably one of the reasons why she he was chosen, because of her humility. Now it does say there in that latter end of that verse, for behold, from henceforth shall all, ge all generations shall call me blessed. Now there's a big difference between calling somebody blessed and bowing down and worshiping them. Yep. And venerating them, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. You know, constructing a statue of them and, and kissing its feet and, and lighting candles to it and praying to it. You know, there's a big difference between that and just saying, well, she was blessed. Now was Mary blessed? Yeah, I would say she was blessed. You know, God blessed her with uh, to, to have that privilege, to have yeah. that honor, to right. have that place in Scripture. But she's not the only person that's ever been blessed mm -hmm. in Scripture, that God has blessed. You know, and, and we bless people all the time. I bless I bless strangers at the door. I say, God bless you, you know, and, and, and when people sneeze, I say, God bless you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not like it's she's saying, from henceforth all generations shall, you know, venerate me and know what a, how important I am and how worthy I am of, of, of praise and worship, and not that they will pray to me. She's just saying, you know what, they're going to acknowledge the fact that I was blessed to have this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And you know what's interesting about Luke 148, again, who's speaking there? Mary. It's not the narrator of the scripture, so take that with a grain of salt as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the Holy Ghost saying that. It's right. just reporting what she said. 
So, <clears throat> not that I think she's in error. I think she is correct that all nations do call her blessed, and, and she does have a special place in Scripture, and that is a blessing. So again, we're only on the first verse. We need to move along. But in that first verse, the other thing I'd point out, it says, in the end of the Sabbath. So when did Jesus arise? At the end of the Sabbath, right? And that's when it had taken place. And why is it? Because Jesus is our Sabbath. Amen. Right? That's what that represents. When He died for us on the cross, you know, he, he was paying the price for our sins, just as that lamb that would be slain was representative of you know, the, the lamb that God would provide one day. And that lamb was Christ. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Jesus is our Sabbath. That's the picture of it there. That you know, that's why these things took place when they did, and there's a lot. I mean, that one topic right there, we could talk about all of the. When you start to compare uh, what happened in those days leading up to Christ's death, and you can make comparisons with the preparation for the Passover in the Old Testament, how were they to take a lamb without blemish for a certain number of days and watch it and observe it and see whether it had a lamp or it was lame, yeah. so they wouldn't offer a lamb sacrifice. Same thing, same time span with Jesus. He was taken. And they, he, you know, it was like three days. And he came into Jerusalem, and they beheld, you know, they beheld him. He was there. It, there's just a lot of, a lot of uh, similarities there. A lot of that we can make. But uh, you know, the Bible does say Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. I mean, that Passover, he's the he is the Lamb that's that's slain from the foundation of the world. He's the last, You know, he died once for all. That's right. That's why you know the self the the uh, it truly had come to an end. That was the end of the Sabbath there, <clears throat> as it says in verse one. Jesus ended that Sabbath. They, they no longer needed to offer the blood of, 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 of bulls and goats and rams, which could not make the, the, you know, the, the comers there unto perfect. You know, now they had that perfect way into the holiest of holies through the blood of Christ. <clears throat> because Christ is our pa Passover sacrifice for us. <clears throat> now notice also it says that it was the first day of the week. Well, it doesn't say that there, but it, 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 this is when it happened. right? This is when, they, when he rose was the first day of the week. It says that in Luke 24, where it says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, uh, sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. So that's why we meet on the first day of the week. I know I preached on this a while back when we were talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Or I think I even preached yeah. a whole sermon of why we meet on the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. That's a major reason right, right there. And that's the example that we see from there on forward throughout the New Testament. You see that the, you know, the book of Acts and other places, they're assembling on the first day of the week. You know that's why Paul was going into the. That's why he's going into the synagogues on the Saturday. Because remember, they used to meet on Saturday. That was the Sabbath. He would go in there on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, and he would preach and teach there. But the only reason he was doing that is because he couldn't do it on the first day of the week. Because on the first day of the week, he was meeting with the brethren. He was breaking bread. He was having church. So people get confused sometimes. I think, well, Paul's going into the, into the synagogue and teaching and preaching on the Saturday. Yeah, but that's evangelism. Mm -hmm. That's his Saturday soul winning time, like we have today, right? We have a soul winning time on Saturday. It's the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. But on Sunday, we're going to church, and that's why what Paul is doing. Why do we go to church on Sunday? Because Christ rose on the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's a lot of examples there. Now, if you would look at verse 2, again, we've got to move along here, but in verse 2 it says, and behold there, came a, uh, behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear ye not, for I, uh, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Now, did that happen at that exact moment when they were there, the earthquake and the angel of the Lord descending? It sounds like it, I, or I don't know if the Bible here is just kind of uh, reiterating something that had already taken place, because when you read elsewhere, you know, they, it says they came to the sepulcher and she saw the stone rolled away. And they went into the sepulcher and saw two, uh, two angels standing, you know, one head at the head one at the foot, and they said, why seek ye the living among the dead? The only is not here. So, you know, I, I still have read these over and over again, it still racks my brain trying to make it all go together just right. That's really not the point. We don't know how to know exactly how every single thing happened. Right. The important thing is, is that it happened. Right. Right? Right. That Christ came back from the dead. That's, that's really the most important thing. Amen. And he says uh, there in verse 5, uh, and, the angel, and the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear, ye not, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. 
So those are great words right there. As he said, right? As was Jesus was saying throughout his ministry that he was going to be crucified and the third day he should rise again. He predicted it. He was telling people, he was telling his disciples over and over again that it was going to happen. Even the Jews remembered that he, he had said this. That if that he if they were to you know destroy he said destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. So they, they understood what Jesus was getting at. They, and, and you know what it goes to show us that you can't stop God from doing what he said he's going to do. And that's what the Jews tried to do the whole time. They were always trying to stop him from teaching, from preaching, from gaining the following that he had. And if you recall Matthew 27, they were they even went to uh, point to Pilate, Pilate and said, you know, you need to guard the sepulcher and make sure that nobody comes and takes the body. Like they and because they were afraid that you know that the that the disciples would come and steal his body and then say, Oh look, he rose from the dead. But remember last week, as I mentioned, all when they did that, all they did was actually make it worse for themselves. Because they put the guards there and now you've got these witnesses. Now you've got these other ones that are seeing all this take place. And, uh, and it just goes to show you again, you can't stop God from doing Amen. what He's doing. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, verse 30, There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. You know, thus say it the Lord. When the Lord says it, you can mark it down. It's going to happen. You know, and you can do that, you know, looking forward to things that are going to take place, and you can do that looking back. You can say, you know what? If God said that's how it happened, that's how it happened. Because it's God that's speaking. And, you know, He couldn't be... Um, he can't be stopped, you know, he couldn't be stopped here, of course, from rising, you know, from rising again from the dead. They couldn't stop him. It didn't matter how many guards they wanted to put there. It didn't matter, you know, if they put that stone on there and just put anchor bolts in it and, and cemented it and, right. you know, parked a Sherman tank against it. That He was coming out of that grave no matter right. what. They could not stop him. Amen. And here's the thing, you know, well, that's you say, well, that's great. We believe that happened. Here's the thing. He also said he's coming again. Amen. You know, he's coming back again. And I don't care how much the heathen rage, I don't care how much they want to deny him, you know, he's coming back and nothing's going to stop him. He yeah. said in, in John chapter 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, uh, and, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. So, I mean, that those words, as he said, those should be a real encouragement to us, that we can look back and say, you know what, it happened just like God said it would. He said he was going to rise from the dead, and that's exactly what he did. But it would also be very much an encouragement to us to say, you know what, he said he's coming again. He said that he has mansions prepared for us. He's going to come and receive us unto himself, that where he is, we may be also. And we can say, well, if he said that, then we know that's going to happen because when God says something, He's going to do it. So these things should be a an encouragement to us. The Bible says in Second Peter chapter three, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ye ought to be in all uh, conversation and and godliness. So you know, there's a way when we understand that we say, well, you know, the Lord He said He's coming back. We know it's a sure thing. That really ought to sink in on us and really cause us to observe. Uh, Consider how we're living our life. You know, what are our goals? What are our priorities? What's important to us? What do we value in life? What is it we're trying to achieve in this life? Is it just the things of this world? The Bible says that all these things are going to be dissolved with fervent heat. Yep. You know, this is all going to burn. You know, if we just, you know, that's why Jesus again and again admonished people, you know, to lay not up treasures for yourselves upon earth, but lay up for yourselves rather treasures in heaven, you know, where moth and rust and not corrupt. You know, where, where it's not going to just turn to ash one day. Where it's not just going to melt. So we understand that He's coming. He said He's going to do it. We're, we have great confidence in that. We're very encouraged by that. But in the same, you know, the flip side of that coin is we, it ought to cause us to do some introspection. It ought to cause us to really think about what it is we're doing with our lives. What is really the most important thing for us? Because eternity is a long time. Eternity is, you know, endless. And everything that we're going to accomplish for God if we've got to accomplish in this life. Right. Of course, we're going to have responsibilities and works to do in heaven, but you know those responsibilities are going to be doled out based on what we accomplished in this life. Yeah. You know, you know, if we did, if we were given much in this life and did did a little with it, why why should we think that God is going to entrust us with greater riches? You know, uh, we've got to be faithful in that which is little in order to be given much. You know, we're given the kingdom of heaven, and He says, "Be thou over ten cities." He's not going to say that to the guy who wasn't faithful in this life. 
who didn't serve, want to serve God in this life. He's right. not going to be the one that's going to get that reward. Right. You know, and some people are content with that. They'll say, well, you know, I'll just sweep the floors in heaven. You know, I don't even know if there's going to be dust there. I don't know. <laughs> right? But that's kind of a bad attitude to have. And I, I tell you what, that, that attitude, that's a sure way to not get any rewards in this life. Right. That's a sure way to not live for God in this life, to have this attitude where I just say, well, I've got my ticket punched to heaven. You know, I've got my, my fire escape. You know, I'm not going to hell. That's good enough for me. You know, praise God for all that, but, you know, you should want more for your life. You should want more for eternity. You should say, you know, I know he's coming again. It's a promise. As sure as he rose from the dead, he's coming again. Yeah. And we ought to do something. We ought to consider what manner of persons we ought to be in this life and live in a way that, so that God can bless us. But uh, it says there in verse 7, the angel speaking, of course, says, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed from the sepulchre with uh, fear and great joy. I mean, that's what a mix of emotions they must have had at that moment. You can just imagine being these, these ladies, you know, that are there. You know, they, I mean, just the roller coaster of emotions that they must have just gone through. And they just saw the Lord, you know, they, some of them watched him die on the cross. They watched where they laid his body, how they laid it. You know, they're grieving over the Sabbath. They don't know what's happened. They come three days later to anoint his body, and this just miracle takes place. You know, and then they see this angel show up. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and then, you know, it's, that's why it says they went with fear and great joy. I mean, they were very afraid of everything that had happened. It was very frightening. I mean, if an angel were to show up here right now, you know, it would probably scare us, you know. I'd probably scream like a little girl. Right. You know, so, right? <laughs> you know the, these, are, these, are, these are these spiritual things. We understand them to be true, but when we actually see, if we were to actually see some of the spiritual realm, it would probably frighten us because it's so out of the ordinary. So you can see why they were very afraid. You know, they're seeing this angel whose who's, who's countenance is the shining of the sun. You know, and uh, all these great things, you know, the earthquake taking place and all these things. But they also had great joy, you know, because, you know, behold, where he, where he laid, he is not here, he is risen. You know, so yeah, this is fearful sight, these fearful uh, circumstances, but there's also great joy. You know, and that kind of makes me think about sometimes when we as a church or individuals, when we go through persecution in our life, you know, sometimes things will start to be, uh, start, people start coming down on us. You know, whether it be the world or our family or something like that, you know, that can be kind of fearful. You know, you can, you know, if something starts going on in the job or something, people start, you know, going after you for the things you believe. You could be uncertain of how things are going to turn out. But at the same time, the Bible says that you should leap for joy. They should be exceeding glad. You know, you should, you should, uh, uh, you should rejoice when, when men persecute you. And you should be, be glad that you leap for joy. The Bible says. So there's that mix of emotion, and it says, and they bring, uh, they did run to bring his disciples word. And it says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. So, you know, this is kind of an impromptu. I, I, you know, they weren't expecting this. They were expect, They were told to just go back and tell them that he goeth forth into Galilee. So they're probably running back and say, hey, we got to get to Galilee to meet Jesus. And, you know, where are the disciples? They're back, you know, wherever they are. They're not at the tomb. They're doing their own thing. All right. And it just goes to show you the people that really want are, are really considerate of the things of God that really want to know you know what's going on you know they, these ladies they got this blessing if they hadn't gotten up early and gone there to do this, this they might not have seen any of this you know they sure wouldn't have met Jesus in the way and, uh, and Jesus met them saying all hail and they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him now again there's a perfect example of somebody being worshiped in the Bible and how do they do it they held him by the feet and if you know if you're going to hold by somebody by the feet you're going to have to bow Right. Right. So, kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, that's a perfect example again uh, of someone being worshipped, and it's involved bowing, right, and getting down there. Right. But again, the, the the thing is, these ladies, you know, they got there early. They were they were committed. They were the ones that were concerned about the things of God. They not to say that disciples had just you know written Jesus off and were moving on with their life or whatever, but they weren't so moved in their heart and and and, and desired to at least just go pay their respects. To you know, get up early and go do that, or maybe whatever reason they weren't there, but it's the people that were there. They got that special blessing, you know, that, that they were the ones that got to meet Jesus in the way. He says in verse 10, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they uh, shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came to the city and showed them the chief priests all things that were done. 
So <clears throat> they come to so the, the guards that are there, the watch that was given them, they, they see all these things, the keepers, they quake, they tremble, you know, and they go back and they tell their bosses, you know, what had taken place. They go back to the chief priest and they tell them, You're not gonna believe this, <laughs> right? He he arose. I mean, what do you think they told him? You know, they, they saw the stone rolled away, they they were there, they made sure nobody came and stole his body by night. What were they telling him? They're telling him he rose. They said, Look, it happened. Turns out he was the Son of God. Turns out he did arise from the dead, just like he said he was going to. And then it goes on to show you why these Jews were rejected of God. Because look at how they quick they hardened their hearts even after all this. All right. After everything that they had seen, everything they had heard and seen of Jesus Christ while he was alive. Then they have these people coming back saying, Yeah, he arose. The stone rolled back, there was an angel. You know, right. and his body's gone. We were there. Nobody took it. Right. We can't explain it. You'd think at that point they'd go, oh man, whoops, and they'd get right with God. Right. But what do they do? They double down again. Yep. And they just keep rejecting God, rejecting God, rejecting God. And it's a biblical doctrine that when people reject God long enough, and especially in the face of great miracles, that they are without excuse. You know, go read Romans one again. Yep. You know, they are without excuse. You know, they, knowing God, you know, but denying the power thereof. Yeah, and these people are rejected of God, and God gives them over to a reprobate mind, and you know, which is which means to be rejected. <clears throat> and it says there in verse twelve, and when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they got their hearts right with God. They said, you know what? He really no, that's not what they did. What did they do? They gave large money unto the soldiers, large money. They knew that this was something, they, if they were going to keep this thing hush-hush, you're going to have to really fork out some dough. I mean, shut these soldiers up. And, uh, you know, nothing much has changed, really, with the Jews, right? I mean, they still got large money, right? right. And they use large money to accomplish what they want in this world. I mean, they that's, that's their, you want to look at who's got the reins of financial institutions, like the Rothschilds and, and all these other, you know, they're Jews. That's not a secret. Yep. That's that's known. That's right. some of the, the probably the richest people in the world. The Rothschilds are Jews, right? And uh, these people have large money, and they do what they want. And you know, we, and I talked about it last week, but you know what? They're the characters that come up twice, you know, twice in a row in these last two chapters. They're they're the people that have the money. They're the people that have the power. And, they have the, and, that, and money has power. You know, in this world, money is power. You know, people are beholden to money. People get so wrapped up with money. I mean, these soldiers, they, they're bought off. You know, it kind of goes to show you what was in their hearts. You know, that they, they saw all these things, but if you give somebody enough money, all right. maybe they will shut up. You know, maybe they do have a price. And it goes on in verse 13 saying, Say, his disciples came by night and stole him, excuse me, stole him away while we slept. So they're giving a ton of money and saying, lie. Lie for us. Yeah. If anybody asks, just tell them a lie. You know? And it's not just, <clears throat> you know, a lie about, you know, we rear end somebody at a red light to say, hey, how can we make this right without we call the insurance company? You know, here's a here's you know, two hundred bucks, you know, we want to call anyone. Right. You know. Now, I've never done that, right? But I know that type of thing happens. <laughs> right? I mean, this was a big deal. Right? Right. And they saw Jesus, they're they're they had to be scratching their heads after everything that had taken place. Mm. And but they're bought out. <clears throat> so they took the money and did as they were taught, and this the saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So, you know, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10, a feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. You know, there's a saying, it reminds me of that saying, and that's what I always think about whenever I read this that verse. Money answereth all things. How are we gonna explain this? Well, let's just see how much money we got. Well, we got we got some large money. Right. Well, let's let's see if we can get people to start telling a lie. And that's what they do. You know, they they what do they what do the Jews have today? They got a lot of money and they got lies. Yep. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and then uh, and then the eleven disciples went into Galilee, verse sixteen, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And they saw him and they worshipped him, but some doubted. And they came and spake unto them, and, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And of course, these last few verses are covering a large, you know, 40 days of Jesus being on earth. The Bible says that he showed himself alive 40 days unto his disciples. 
So it wasn't just like Jesus rose that day, they went to Galilee, and then he, that was it. There was 40 days that he spent with them, showing himself alive, teaching them things, and, and doing, and, you know, and, and, and it wasn't just, you know, bam, bam, bam. So this is kind of just a synopsis of everything that had happened at the end of his ministry. And he says, he came unto them speaking, and this, of course, is his ascension, where he's ascending up from the Mount of Olives into heaven in their sight. And he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now it's interesting, though I just, you know, we read these words and we hear it preached and we just, we get used to them. You know, there's certain parts of the Bible I think that we just hear it so, so often. We hear so much preaching on it. We just kind of, I don't say we grow numb, but we just kind of, yep, I understand that. But sometimes we need to be reminded of what is being said here. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. God is saying, he's saying, look, I have all the power in the world and in heaven. Right. There's nothing I can't do. Right. You know, and what's he tell them to do? Join a militia. You know, build a bunker. <laughs> you know, and hold out until I come and, and show that power. Right? Buy food, you know, beans, batteries, and what's the other one? Bullets. I knew it. Somebody <laughs> knew it. <laughs> I used to know it too. I can't remember what it was. It was a third beat. Bullets, beans, and batteries. You know, he's, he's saying, dig in. You know? No, he's telling them, go ye therefore. Right. Right? He's saying, go teach all nations. You know, he's got all the power there is on the world, and what is he telling us to do? To go out and preach. Yeah. To go out and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. So that's a great, you know, there's a, of course the Great Commission, that's what we call that. That's the great command for us to go out as ambassadors for Christ, and to, uh, you know, and, and implore people to be reconciled with God. You know, to beseech them to be reconciled with God. And, you know, sometimes when we do that, we can get discouraged and we can get uh, maybe a little frightened by that, especially if we're first starting out, or maybe it's something we don't feel is that important. And we can think, well, is it, you know, am I really even making a difference? But here's this thing. He says, I am with you always. That was the promise he said. Right after he gave the commandment, he said, Lo, I am with you always. You know, so when you go out there and you're doing the Lord's work, I mean, you can think about the fact that the Lord is with you. And when you, the Lord is with you, who is it that you have with you? You have with you the one to whom all power is given in heaven right. and earth. I mean, that's quite the thought to think about. Then we're just going out and just simply walking up and down these streets in this city. And it's going door to door and just talking to ordinary people and opening up a book with black and white pages in it and just simply preaching the gospel that the, the God of heaven and earth, the all-powerful, the almighty God, the highest, you know, the, the, the most high, right? The Lord of lords, the King of kings is with you when you do that. So that should be encouragement to us. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the admonishment that he's giving his disciples. Go preach the gospel. You know, I have all power. Go preach and don't worry, I'm with you. And that should be a comfort to you because all power is given unto me. And he says, I am with you all the way, even unto the world. Amen. So, you know, Jesus taught a lot of important things in the book of Matthew. As we went through this there, I mean, you know, you have the greatest preaching ever done in Matthews 5, 6, yeah. and 7. You have, you know, the, the Beatitudes. You have the, the, the Sermon on the Mount and many other things that he taught and the miracles that he did. And, you know, and he commanded a lot of things in the Bible, too. You know, he told us a lot of things that we should, we, you know, that we should... Uh, you know, love our neighbors as ourselves that we should do unto others as we have them do unto us. And, and a lot of other great things that Jesus taught throughout the book of Matthew that we read about. But his parting words, this, the last commands he gives is this command right here. You know, and that's in all, and then the Gospels that record that last command, you know, that's it. That was the last thing Jesus Christ spoke before he went up into heaven to his disciples, was a command to go out and preach the Gospel. You know, it wasn't you know? He didn't just say, you know, dig in and wait till I come back. He said, go do something with the things that I've taught you. You know, teach the things, uh, teach them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. And he said, don't just take all the information that I've given you and do nothing with it. He wants us to go out and do that. You know, we read through the book of Matthew, we've learned a lot of great things, and we've probably maybe implemented a lot of those things in our life. But what good is that going to do anybody else if we don't go teach these things? And that's the whole point, you know. We learn these things so that we can go out and teach these things and bring others to Christ. So, you know, he commanded a lot of things, but his parting command is the Great Commission to go and teach all these things. I mean, you think about a person's parting words, you know, it's usually pretty important. It's not just your average goodbye. You know, if one of us were going to be moving away, you know, to another city, maybe we'd never see each other again on this earth. 
know, last time I hope it would be more than just like, well, hey, have a nice life. You know, right. I'm not saying we have to like get as, as you know, deep as this, you know, <laughs> but it, I'm sure at least in our hearts we would feel like, hey, you know, this right. is kind of a, this isn't just another goodbye. Right. You know, we've probably all experienced that, I'm sure. So a person's parting words, they're important. And what were his, he could have said anything here. Right. He could have made them to do anything. And this wasn't the first time he commanded this. You know, you go back to, uh, you know, uh, like I think it's Luke 10, you know, where he tells them to go and to preach. And, you know, he sends them before his faith whether, whether he himself would come, you know, to every city and place. So this wasn't the first time God, God had given them a great commission, but it was the last thing he said. And that's how important it is. You know, and think about again, I know I've mentioned this in the past, but think about when he does it. He does it when he's in the, if we were going to Acts, he says that he was a, as he ascended up into yeah. heaven out of their sight. Yeah. I believe he's and it wasn't just like like he was like that. I when I read that, I meant if you let go of like a I, he was probably even slower than a helium balloon. I just think he's slowly and maybe he was even speaking these words. And he's, I mean can you imagine me just preaching to you right now and just slowly starting to send up in heaven, I would have your attention. Right. You know what I mean? There would be no, there would no be, be no wondering, you know, what's the flavor of the month at EG's right now? Right. That, that, would, that wouldn't even cross your mind. Right? Jesus. You'd be, I'd have your, your attention. I believe that's what Jesus did here. I mean, that's how important this is. Mm -hmm. That he says, you know what, the last thing I'm going to say to him, I'm going to say, as I ascend out of their sight. He'd never done that before. I mean, They'd seen him walk on water. They'd seen him do a lot of great things. They'd seen him, you know, walk through that, just appear in their sight and disappear out of their sight after he. Were, they saw him, you know, he was raised from the dead. Yep. He did a lot of things, but he never done this. He never ascended into a cloud out of their sight, you know. And so he's trying to make an impression. He's trying to show us how important this commission is, Amen. you know. And we're in a church, you know. I know I'm, I'm preaching the choir. We're soul winners here, but don't ever lose the zeal for it, you know. And don't ever get tired of hearing about about soul winning. You know, why is it that this church and churches like this go soul winning? Because the soul winning gets preached. Yeah. And when the soul winning stops getting preached, when 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 the when we stop reminding ourselves to go soul winning, that's when we're gonna stop soul winning. When we stop thinking when we start to forget how important it really is. When we just read over the end of Matthew twenty eight and just say, Yeah, I remember the Great Commission said something about going into the whole world. Yeah. And it's not a big deal to us anymore. So why is it we go soul winning time? It's because we preach all the time. Why do we preach all the time? Because it's what Jesus Jesus preached. He preached to go into all all the world and preach to you know all nations, teaching them to observe all things. And that's what we ought to do. And that's hopefully what you know we learned a lot of great things out of, out of Matthew. And you know hopefully we can do as they were instructed to take these things that we've learned to go out there and obey this great command to go out and and to teach others also. Let's go ahead and pray.